right. Yeah, welcome back. Uh, this is the final deep dive before we go to lunch. Uh, I speak to hundreds of founders every year, uh, and yet, this happened for the first time. I was speaking to the colleague of our uh, next speaker, and she rounded up the number of companies that are founded by this uh, entrepreneur. So that was a uh, very first uh, time for me. Uh, now, uh, our speaker is uh, turning the tables and making the startup game less about luck uh, and more about strategy at uh, Seedblink. Think of Seedblink as uh, a Swiss army knife uh, for, for founders and uh, investors. Uh, Seedblink, of course, uh, is also uh, an official program partner for uh, the Upstream Festival. Uh, let's uh, welcome him with a big round of applause, uh, Rod Radu Georgescu. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you, guys. Do it? Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, it's such a great pleasure to, to be here and to be able to speak to you. And I look forward to actually engaging and answering questions. So it's so much nicer to answer questions and to, to, to learn what's happening in the world and uh, actually improve and upgrade myself. So my plan is that to uh, give you kind of uh, a little bit of a rundown of who I am and what I've did in, in my life, a little bit of sibling, and then what I've learned uh, in, in my experience. I'm an experienced guy. I'm uh, 56 years old, so let's call it experience. Um, and I have quite a few things that I've learned, and hopefully I'm not doing the uh, same mistakes again, right? Is, is this okay? As a plan? Cool plan. So, um, you know, I, I knew I was going to be an entrepreneur even before knowing what the hell an entrepreneur is. Uh, as a kid, I've, I've, I've been growing in a family not poor, not rich, but you know, I didn't really have money for my beer in the, in the high school. So I started like doing the homework for my for my colleagues, and that was my first enterprise, right? I didn't sell it to nobody, um, but it was interesting. I, I realized that you know, working for money is something good. And I kind of realized the difference between uh, a job where you go to, 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 to work and you don't take any risk and you know, actually uh, you, you get money at the end of the month, or an entrepreneurship thing where you have to actually sell. And if, if, uh, if a colleague doesn't need something from you, you don't get the beer at the end of the day, right? Um, and, and then got into college. And I realized at some point in time, and this, this was back in really, really early 90s. Um, so I got into the computer's room, and I realized that there are two options for doing the colleagues' homework. One is that you, know, you work two hours, you get 10 bucks. One, 10 more bucks, you work two more hours, you know, two hours, 10 bucks, two hours, 10 bucks. Or you work a couple of days for a program, and then you input data, print, input data, print, 10 bucks, input data, print, 10 bucks. Man, so this exponential growth, it's absolutely amazing. So it, it got me and I said, whoa, that's what I want to do. I don't want to build cars where I'm building a car, I'm selling it and that's it. I need to build another car and sell it. I'm gonna write software for, for, for my career or life, right? So ended up selling my license, my college license, to, to the Autodesk distributor. That was my first exit, so to say. That was amazingly interesting. I learned about IP, about lawyers, about uh, this kind of stuff, and I was, whatever, 21 years old. So really, really amazing experience and learnings there. And then things started, like, you know, great companies, and some of them uh, were amazing experiences. Some of them ended up being acquired and, and uh, got to be something bigger. Um, ju just a few of them, but all of them in, in software and in exponential growth type of businesses. Um, so among the nicer ones, Microsoft acquired Rav Antivirus back in 2000 something, um, and it actually became the core of their security business. So before us, they didn't have security, and my colleagues that uh, moved to Redmond are even today the, the, the core of Microsoft security, whatever this means. Um, and then um, build a pay, an online payments business that uh, Naspers acquired. It became PayU. Even today, 
uh, PayU is based on, uh, globally is based, uh, the payment processor is based on uh, e-payment technology and that's really nice to, to remember and to acknowledge and to, to be proud of. Um, a, a, a few others and then realizing that things are interesting, not only on technology, not only on sales, but actually on the corporate side. I, I thought, like, man, you know, need to build something to serve the equity part of the company. Because I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking a company as a uh, dust watch, right? With a, with a CEO right in the middle, the operations uh, on, on, the, on the lower side, and the equity part, which is, you know, the board of advisors, the shareholders, and so on, on top of it. And there are so many tools and books and, and uh, trainings and so on to, to, to help CEOs to handle their, their uh, operationals part, you know, the ERPs and all type of tools. But there is basically nothing like a Swiss, Navy, uh, uh, Swiss, Swiss um, knife, right? To help CEOs and shareholders to manage the company's um, equity. And that's when, when we started, you know, we're co uh, four co-founders, we started back in 2020, uh, Sidling. And that's uh, where we help, you know, people to get in the equity of the company, to buy in the company, to invest. And then companies and investors to manage their equity, you know, manage ESOPs, manage cap tables, manage um, corporate governance and so on. And actually at the end of the day to trade, to exit as an investor from, uh, from that things. And it's amazing. So what I did is that for the first time in my life, it's the, the only company I'm working for. And you know, I'm at number 37 for four years now. So that, that's kind of creepy for me. Uh, I, it, it feels interesting. But uh, just, just keep the uh, name in mind. It's going to be the next unicorn in any case. So I, I've learned a few things uh, out of, out of this lifetime experience. And I'm not going to go through all of them, uh, not, not enough time for, for this. Um, but I want to speak about the value. And I, a lot of VCs are asking you guys when you go pitch, um, what's your plan with the company? How are you going to sell it? Who's going to acquire the company? Right? And my answer to this is, I don't know. I don't care. My problem is not to create a company to sell. My my objective, my goal, is to create an amazing company. And that's what we need to do. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, by the way, the companies are getting sold and it brings money to the, to the, to the shareholder, it brings money to me as a founder. It's amazing, it's great. But that's, a, that's not the planned outcome. The plan is to create an amazing, an amazing company that actually changes the world and makes the world better. And I think that's one of the most important things to have in mind as, as an entrepreneur, right? Um, and doing this, ethics is important. And it's not 99.9% .9 ethics. It's 100% ethics. I think that um, some people say, oh, if you need to speak it, it means it's that, you know, it's not good. No, for God's sake, we need to speak it. I, I, I mean, Ethics is when you need to do something that you don't like. Ethics is when you are doing something that you are incentivized not to do. Ethics is when it's hard to do it. And I think that a great company, and that, that's connected to the value part of thing. I think that a great company is when it's built on ethics and on really, really doing what is right, right? Um, I'm, I'm going to jump on innovation and give it a twist. Everybody speaks, you know, innovation is great and, you know, we need to be innovative and everything. Um, after 37 companies, uh, 36, and let's see where, where the 37 comes, goes, um, I, I think that the biggest innovation is to fail differently every time. I think that failing in the same way, it's stupidity. I mean, failing, failing twice in the same way is like bland stupid. We, you need to fail differently and to learn from every, every failing. I mean, I failed one of the companies, just to give you an example, right? One of the freaking companies was back in 94, 
uh, there was Norton Commander at that time. Anybody old enough to, to have worked with Norton Commander? Yeah, thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we should get a drink together at some point in time and share memories. So Norton Commander was like, you know, Windows File Explorer, but for non-Windows type of computers, right? Uh, and you had your, you, you, can, you could see the, the drive and you can move files and whatever it is, right? And it was 29 bucks. Um, and I'm from Romania. Uh, software engineers at that time were damn cheap. Uh, can we create GCAT Fast Commander, we called it, uh, and sell it for nine bucks and make a lot of money? Yeah, we can. We did. Actually, pretty quick, like in six months, we did it. And then what we actually didn't realize was that after 1994, comes 1995, what happened in 1995, Windows 95 came up, right? And that means the end of Norton Commander, the original, forget a clone, right? So understanding, and we were all kids at the time, and, but we realized that understanding what the market, where the market is going, and what the market is asking for, and um, all these dynamics of the next year, because you are building something for, for quite a few years, that's something important. And you know, the next failures, we didn't do the same mistakes. We've been very innovative in mistakes, yeah, don't get me wrong, did others, but not that one. And I, I think enjoyment, joy in, in, in doing everything, it's amazing. I, I wouldn't, I, I don't think any of us can actually um, create an amazing company as an entrepreneur with um, anger, by fighting. I think that enjoyment is, uh, is something, joy is something that um, helps us going and creating an amazing company. Now there's one more thing, obviously. Um, other than all this kind of, I, I mean, they are pretty obvious, these ones, but um, um, there, there's one very interesting thing that I, I didn't necessarily see in it in other books, which is understand what business you are, you are in. And I'm, I'm a VC myself, I'm investing you know, from my family office and, and so on, so I'm, I'm seeing basically about 200 startups a month, which is quite a lot. Um, and um, most of the startups do not know what business they're in. And I'm, I'm giving you an example and, and tell you why is this important. So I'm comparing now European soccer, you know, football, right, with um, American NBA, you know, basketball. And what business do you think football is in? Now, NBA is in entertainment. Football is in sports. And the difference is, NBA is one league, 30 teams. You are the last one, kudos to you. What's happening is that the last one gets the most money for next year. And the most incentives are getting the first draft. And so on, right? So. If, if you don't do well, they, in, they incentivize you. So the last one in the league actually gets more money than the first one because they want a league that is pretty flat and the games and the entertainment is very cool. Now, football on the other hand, the last one gets on the second league and the last one gets on the third league. So basically in order to Purely in order to exist, I mean, forget uh, money or anything. In order to exist, you need to have success. And the first one, the, the winner, I'm not saying takes it all, but the winner gets the most money. So the incentive is to play well. In NBA, the incentive is to actually make a show out of it. So those are two very interestingly different businesses, even though they, are, they, they look similar, but they're so intrinsically different. 
And it makes all the, all the difference when you think of the businesses. There are so many um, online shops that, I mean, I'm creating a shop, it's unique because it sells uh, fashion. Ah, okay, really. But an, an online shop can be in retail, can be in marketplace, can be in logistics, can be in so many businesses, and one needs to understand what business are you in, what vertical are you in, and then go and understand all the nitty gritties of that type of a business. For MBA, you know how the entertainment is being done. And it wouldn't work in football. So I've seen uh, football teams in Europe trying to replicate NBA because it's a big entertainment success, trying to replicate entertainment things from the MBA. It doesn't really work because you are in a different business. So I, I think one interesting learning is that and really understand um, what, what business you are in. Um, having said this, um, I would actually like to speak with you guys. So any questions, any whatever it is to go forward? <laughs> let's uh, let's uh, do that. Uh, thanks, uh, Radu. Also, yeah. I mean, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, these, these 10 things that we know, right? Everybody knows these are important, but you shared your own unique perspective on these 10 different <laughs> things. So thanks uh, about that. Um, and also, I think it's very fitting that you end on uh, joy. Uh, <laughs> and you're talking about, uh, you're not talking about earning your bread, but you're talking about earning your beer at the end of the day. That's, uh, that's an interesting take. Also, Robin and Sander, by the way, here, also from Seedlink. Uh, uh, they're very popular around the startup ecosystem, if you want to talk to them later. Yeah, uh, by the way, they're, uh, up there, there, there is a table with Seedlink name on it, so they're uh, all there, my colleagues. So um, you are building a company. I, I think you really need Seedlink. <laughs> all right, there is not a lack of ways to find them. I'll yeah. come first to you and then uh, to you. Hello, nice for the talk. It was a very nice uh, view on the football and NBA uh, sports. Uh, I have a question. So I saw in the first slide uh, the span of 40 years of experience, different companies. Uh, you mentioned that you're from Romania, but I assume you lived in other countries maybe, no? So all the I'm business- I'm traveling a lot, so I live yeah. in BA actually. So all the businesses uh, been built in, in Romania and sold from there, so- S Started in Romania and relocated whenever needed, depending okay. on the business. So Did Avangate was moved in Silicon Valley and, and yeah. sold to Francisco so Partners. But would yeah. you have any um, like uh, experience or view on the different locations of building businesses or, or not, maybe any tips or differences between countries in that regard over the last 40 years? Thanks. Yeah, yeah, ab ab absolutely. So look, the, um, th there are obvious differences between geographies, um, w w which are like, you know, in the US there is the market, there is the money, there is the investment, but there's a red ocean, so there's fierce competition. Uh, and Europe, it's like it's not one market, it's 27 markets, 27 legislations, and you know, need, need to figure out what the differences are. China has its own problems, now Russia has its own problems. I, I mean, uh, countries uh, are, are, are very different. I, what, what I would do, and what I'm doing actually, is that um, basically I, I figure out what I, what I want to do next, and then that, like, like with the Norton Commander, right? That, you figure out where you want to do it. And if, it, if it's to be a global business, let's build a global business. If it's a local business for uh, Netherlands, let's build a local business for Netherlands. And there are no better, better way uh, to do it. Um, having said all this, building a business home, it's so much easier. It's so much easier, so much nicer. I mean, you have your own support groups and friends and, and so on. Is, is that also why most of the companies start in Romania before uh, going elsewhere? Most of the companies started in Romania and then moved into their specific markets that, yeah, abs absolutely. And for that reason. And, and your home market is so nice to you. I mean, you can fail, you can try, you can, uh, you can try a lot of things. Hi. 
Eric here, also Eric. serial entrepreneur, but you've done uh, more than I did so far. Um, quick question. So one of the struggles that I see in the industry that they say you have to have a focus. So when you start a company, you have to have a focus. So first one is how long do you focus in one company? And the second one, the most crucial one, when do you delegate? Um, I, I, I'm very lucky. I'm going to start with the second one. I'm very lucky that I have never been a CEO in my life. Uh, my, my natural role is a chairman of the board. Uh, and, and therefore, all the companies that I've been started as a founder, including Sidbink, I'm not the freaking CEO of, the, of Sidbink, right? Um, have their own CEOs. And they're properly, professionally run by, by CEOs. Therefore, the delegation is, is very easy. So I understand the problem. I have a lot of friends having this problem. I don't necessarily know how to answer it because I don't have the problem. I'm lucky enough not to have this problem. Um, second one, um, it's kind of related because being in this position, I have the luxury to be able to work on multiple projects in the same time because they don't necessarily uh, take all my, all my uh, time and resources. So working two, three, uh, maybe companies in the same time as chairman of the board is totally acceptable. Uh, for, for me, so I can do that. I love what I do, so I work 12, 16 hours a day, so I can uh, stretch in. How long before calling uh, a learning experience? Um, I, I don't know, you just know when things are, I mean, when you start throwing you know, good money after bad money, then pull the plug and next one. Can you, on that same point, talk about uh, how do you go about identifying the CEOs to run these companies, but also are there some CEOs that have helped run multiple companies of yours? Uh, ab absolutely, yes. And getting to this age, uh, you, you get... Uh, so I've been uh, counting at some point in time. I didn't have what to do for a couple of days. Uh, so th there are about 5,000 people that went through companies in relation, in connection to me. Um, and some of them during, during their trips in the company didn't get nothing because there were like, you know, failed companies. Uh, some of them became millionaires and multimillionaires because there are no amazing companies, ESOP and so on. Um, so people try to come back and to do things together and people that you know we connected well and we did good, great things together for the benefit of the world and ours as well. Uh, let, let's do things again. And um, I, I think it's not easy to, to get the right CEO. Um, I think that if you don't, the easiest way is to know somebody that you know already if, somehow, um, but, um, it, it comes back to this um, to this complexity thing. At the end of the day, an entrepreneur has to solve all the things. I mean, a company, it's a, it's a damn complex puzzle. I mean, the, there are so many things. And you know, finding the right CEO, when this is going to happen, where do, where do I get money from? And, and I mean, there are so many things um, are part of life. All right. Any more questions? So over there, can you please pass this on? Hey, uh, so we today learned, or maybe some knew before, that whenever someone is investing in a company, in a startup, they really look at the team. And you said that you keep investing even up until this day. So what is a deal breaker in a team for you? And what is the thing that you're looking the most? Yeah. Um, I, what, 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 I, what I'm personally looking, and each investor is looking at different things. And when you raise money, if, if I were to raise money for my company, what I would do is I would get training to become a VC, right? So I, I, I would go to a course that trains me how to become a VC for the only reason that I'm learning what these guys are looking for, mm. right? So I know what to sell to them and how to sell to them. I know their needs. So now, the, the Quick down round on what, what a VC now uh, want is that they want different things. And it is important that you understand that VC and that VC. And that. So one, one thing that Seedbring does, for example, is it kind of matches you with, with your own business and everything with the right you know, five VCs 
uh, in Europe. So you don't speak to 300 that, you know, 295, they, they wouldn't look at you just because it, you are not in their thesis, right? So me personally, I'm looking at the uh, ability to execute. I think that execution is the core make it or break it for a company today. Now, it's not technology, so 20 years ago it was technology and, and it changed, but today we all have ideas. We all have ideas in the morning, you know, between bed and loo, you know, we have 20 ideas. The question is, do we have the ability personally or as a team to execute? Now, what this means uh, in, in, in the real life is, do you have the technological ability? Do you have the commercial ability? Do you have the financial ability? Do you have, as a team, the, the complexity and the ability to actually execute the business on all type of um, directions? And that, that's the important thing for me. I'm seeing a lot of uh, uh, startups created by three uh, programmers. And you know, I love them. I'm a programmer myself, I still program. Mm. But I, you know, you cannot create a company with three, only, I mean, only three programmers. Yeah. Well said. That was good advice. Uh, every founder, <laughs> every founder should also get uh, a course on how to be a VC. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, and I know uh, from Seedplink, some of your events, you also focus on this topic. So please check out the website. Anybody else? Uh, questions, please. You, sir, first, and then him. Yeah. Hi, my name is Michael. Um, my question is: I think you've done this test six times, but the real question is: How do you identify what business your company is in, and? Um, from your personal experience, and then what tips do you have to other people who are like starting companies now? Uh, that, yeah, th thank you so much. That, that's a very hard thing to do. Um, it, it's kind of easy to recognize. I, I can easily recognize what business you are in, but I can, I, I, for, for the God of me, I, 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 I very hardly look at myself and try to understand what business I am in, right? So that, that's one of the hardest processes. Uh, are, and at some point, you have to take a decision and to figure out, sometimes customers are telling you what business they want you to be in. Sometimes, as Steve Jobs was saying, customers don't know what they want. And sometimes you are right and you are, you are telling them what they want and you're right, but sometimes you're trying to push them in a direction that they don't really need and you are the stupid one. Um, I, I, I think the answer is you need to ask yourself this question as much as possible and at some point hopefully you're going to figure out the answer. All right. Next question, please. Thank you. you you've done so many things. Maybe it's an, a hard question, but what was the most difficult moment in your journey? Most difficult moment in my journey? Uh, man, I, look, I, I'm, I'm a stoic. I, I, don't, I, I don't look, um, I, I don't look behind and I don't cry after spilled milk. Um, I know that whenever I took decisions where the best decision with the, with the existing information. Um, the, the, every company had very tough moments, you know, plugging off a company, it's a very hard decision every time. Um, had a very bad moment with the dot-com bubble. Uh, Rav Antivirus was about to be acquired by, by F-Secure. And in order for that acquisition to happen, we kind of invested a little more uh, that that then needed, and then uh, dot com bubble burst, and F Secure said, "No, we are not acquiring anymore." And therefore, the company went, you know, like below <laughs> below zero. So that was a very very hard moment. That was 2000 ish. Um, in general, the money problems are the hardest ones uh, because not not for other reasons, but because it implies people around. And you know, you are you, you have the question, you know, do you try to save the company? And if this if if you want to do this, how do you do about people? Because you know, you get into saving the company, cutting costs, and you know where this goes. And it's fucking hard. 
pardon my French. And um, yeah, I, I guess that, that's where it goes. Yeah. All right, we'll take another one. I saw a couple of hands over here in the audience. No? Over there? Yeah. Yes. Can you pass on uh, the, the microphone, please? Uh, oh, hit! <laughs> Luckily, it's a, it's a cushion. That's a microphone. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if it... Oh, here we go. Thank you, Rada, for the talk. I found it very uh, informative. Sorry for the maybe general question, but I'll ask you. So what is some advice that you would recommend to any entrepreneur? And out of all the lessons that you learned, what is the one thing that you can say that just anybody can use? Yeah. Uh, no, that, that's a fair point. And it all starts with the beginning. The, the, the main advice to an entrepreneur, to myself actually, is are you an entrepreneur or not? And it goes to, to, the, to the risk, uh, the, the, the ability to take risks. So I think that there are two types of people and there is n none better than the other. I think that there are entrepreneurs and people that, that have to be employed. And you know, you can, you can earn a lot of money as an entrepreneur and you can earn the same lot of money as, as you know, just think of, uh, you know, uh, you know the, the CEO of Google. I mean, he's making a shitload of money, right? As an employee, he's not an entrepreneur by no uh, measure. Um, so, and, and I think the first question is that, am I an entrepreneur? Am I able to swallow the risk of the entrepreneurship? In a moment when, so, so if I know today that tomorrow is the, uh, the payday, the salary day, and there is no money in the bank account. Can I sleep? Right? And it's not carelessness or whatever, it's just the ability to sleep because tomorrow you need to, to make things and to need to, to get the money in the company. And if you don't sleep, you you are worse, right? So I, I think that this ability to understand whether you are prepared to take the risk, therefore become an entrepreneur. Entrepreneur is not like a fairy tale thing, it's it's a damn hard thing. Are you an entrepreneur or not? If you are, by all means, start early, go fail, fail, fail. Hopefully, you are gonna win before, <laughs> before you cannot try one more. Um, if you are not an entrepreneur, go get hired by Microsoft and, and climb the ladders and become the CEO of Microsoft and, and get your money that way. Yeah, cool. but please try, but also, <laughs> if it's not for you, be willing to uh, let it go, uh, because it's also not for everyone. Well, we'll take one more question from the audience. Sir, hold it. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Wait. Thank you for all information. My question is, when will you um, just uh, die a business? Just pulling out and say, it doesn't work, I will just kill it. Yeah, well, uh, that, that's, that, that's a little bit of a feeling about uh, a combination of uh, when you are starting to, to throw in, you know, good money after bad money. And the company is just kind of uh, living one day after the other based on a dream that you can actually see is not happening. Uh, it, it's, it's a very non-emotional, it has to be non-emotional. The question is, can you be non-emotional? Uh, but it has to be non-emotional, and um, that, that's when uh, th this keep honest thing, it's, it's, uh, it's very good. I mean, um, as an entrepreneur, you have to surround yourself with, with people that, um, that keep you honest, that keeps you non-emotional and uh, keeps you non-arrogant after a success. I, I've been there and I've done that. Uh, after one of the successes, I, I've uh, started beginning to think that, you know, I'm God, at least, uh, and whatever I touch, it turns into gold, and it very quickly proved that it's not true. Mm -hmm. And having good friends that kicks you uh, behind your head, like, you know, come on, man, you know, <laughs> fuck off, you know, we're, we're all the same, we go to the same loo, for God's sake, right? Uh, um, that's, that's helping to know when to, when to uh, pull off a company, plug off. Nice. One final question, Radu. Yes, uh, from my side, uh, you said uh, Seed Blink is going to be the next uh, unicorn. Uh, yeah. what, what, what are the indicators that, uh, that uh, make you say this? Um, look, that, um, I, I'm, I'm going to start with the market. 
even though for me, the, the team is most important, but I'm going to start with the market. It, it's a blue ocean, for God's sake. I mean, there is really there is a problem, which is handling the equity of a company that, that, that has no other solution than SeedBlink. And I, I think that's amazing. Uh, blue ocean things are, are very hard to solve. I mean, it's blue ocean because there's a problem. I mean, people, it's not that people didn't think of it. It's people didn't weren't able to do it. For some of us that might not know what a blue ocean is, uh, what is a blue ocean? Right, so the red ocean is, is a market where there are so many competition and it's a, a fierce competition, but a lot of requests and a lot of money in the market. Whereas blue ocean is a market where there is nobody there. If there is nobody there, it's very easy potentially to get in. Um, but, you know, maybe there is actually no market. You know that, that joke with, I, I'm going to Africa, nobody has shoes. Uh, one salesman comes and says, oh, there's no opportunity, nobody has shoes. And the other, whoa, such a great opportunity, nobody has shoes, right? So, um, yeah, that's the uh, blue ocean, red ocean. So I think being in a blue ocean, uh, it's, it's a great opportunity. Now, the ability to, to execute into the blue ocean, that's a different question. Hopefully, we're going to be able to do it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. We have a small gift uh, from oh, uh, the upstream. Thank you so also. much. Appreciate it. This is uh, a very Rotterdam kind of gift. Uh, it's, it's artwork, Appreciate but it's also a shopping bag that you can take with you everywhere. Appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. That was amazing talking to you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah.